Rally Point with Dominic Fielder, author of the King's German series, and myself, Rob McLaren, author of the Gobert series. At Rally Point, we catch up with friends who enjoy the Napoleonic period, and we're recording this half-hour interview, and once the recording is over, we'll hang out online afterwards and the conversation. This month, we'd like to welcome Dominic Pott, war gamer and miniature collector, uh, a student of history, especially barbarian involvement in the Napoleonic period. Dominic's uh, chatting to us uh, this morning from his home in Bavaria, Germany. Welcome, Dominic. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. Thank you, Rob. Now, tell, tell us, Dominic, about your inspiration in the Napoleonic period. Where did it come from? Um, I think the, the, the first time I got into touch with Napoleonics was during my university studies um, when I grabbed a book of um, John H. Gill, an American uh, historian writing about um, the Bavarian allies or the, the German allies of Napoleon. And this book caught my attention and then I start digging into Napoleonic history. Um, I started reading historic novels, the, the Bernard Cornell Sharp series. So that, then everything was set off. And since then, I'm attached to the Na Napoleonic uh, period. Yeah. I was just thinking that how much Bernard Cornwall's responsible for, for people's interest worldwide in things Napoleonic. And, and it's it's hard to think of a, of a series of books that we could have read before that which would have drawn us into the era as much. So and it's, in, it's interesting because the, that's the very thing, that's the very series of books, Dominic, that drew me into the period. So, you know, two people, and Rob, is that the same for you? Is that the same? Um, or, did you, or, yeah. or did you have an interest beforehand? I I I think I've read the Hornblower series. Yes, of, of, right. Um, the, the, the Neville Wars, before I read the Cornwall books, um, um, but I got in touch uh, with the television series of uh, uh, Sharps Rifles because it was uh, dubbed and translated into German so, and it was uh, a broadcast, broadcasted on the German television. And then it was like, oh, okay, there's a series of books based on the novels of Bernard Cornwall. And then I start, started to read. But I think you're right, Dominic, that... Um, it's it's a worldwide interest and it was created for example if you if you look in germany uh, so there isn't a book series about a prussian officer merging through the ranks but even as i'm a german i read the stories of yeah yeah okay <laughs> but 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 in, in in my youth there wasn't such a novel so i started to dig into uh reading about a green coat, a red coat officer, and, and, and about the British army, even though I'm German. I think uh, I'd like to throw a number of other aspects into the mix. One would have been the Waterloo movie of 1970. 1970 or 72, or was that? Yeah, so the 70, Waterloo, I think, yeah, 70, yeah, yeah. So the Waterloo movie, around the same time as Donald Featherstone's uh, books were coming out around uh, miniature gaming um, would, would have been on the back end of Hornblower. Um, Hornwell was bringing out his books in the early 80s um, as a small child in, in outback rural Australia. Uh, I found the Airfix uh, soldiers, so I must have been 12, 13, finding the Airfix Waterloo soldiers, uh, the plastic sets, back in the mid-late 70s um, and then not having any idea as to what to do or, you know, and, and learn to paint them and, and et cetera, et cetera. So they would have been other influences just prior to, to Cornwall. And then um, I'm, we must find out what the, the, the time of the series is, but the Sean Bean, again, we're coming back to that visualisation of like the Waterloo Battles um, or the Waterloo movie, but the TV series of up with Sean Bean, suddenly we've all got this picture of the character in our mind. And I I yes, think it's a it's a 
scale as well. Um, if, if you look at the Bondarchuk uh, uh, 1970 Waterloo movie, then it's this epic battle taking place. Um, and if you look at the uh, at the at the Sharp series, um, then you the, the scale is much more smaller. You are in this skirmish environment and level, so it it was more personal. And uh, in this case, not not a general's history, but an an ordinary soldier officer. Yes, and and Dominic, you've got um, battlefield in your backyard. And uh, and I'm going to uh, bring up, uh, share the screen and bring up um, map. And I'd, I'd like you to tell us about your backyard. And I was very, very lucky in, in October of 2022 to walk the battlefield with you. So there we, there's the battlefield. I'm about to share this with everybody. And would you tell us about it, please? Add okay, on. yeah. Now the screen is the, the screen is on. Um I discovered by chance um an, a wartime diary uh, written in, in, in eighteen twelve um by an officer, an Bavarian officer uh, in the Bavarian War Ministry. And he was writing about the events taking place in eighteen oh nine. Um uh, when the Austrians uh, invaded Bavaria, which was by then an ally to France, part of the Rheinbund, uh, and um, uh, King Max the uh, First, Maximilian the First, was elected to, to, to be the first Bavarian king by Napoleon. So, um, as we say in Bavaria, so. Uh, by the grace of Napoleon, he became king, um, uh, being one of the uh, Rheinbund kings. And um, Bavaria, I think, almost doubled in size. There were a lot of uh, territories or, or, um, uh, which became Bavarian, including Tyrol, which is, um, if you look at the map now, you, you, you see the, the mountain line uh, in the south, which is um, the, the, the foothills of the Alps. And south of it um, is Tyrol, uh, with its capital Innsbruck, which is now centered in the uh, in, in the screen. And the Bavarians took hold of uh, uh, Tyrol. They called it South Bavaria then, and um, which was uh, the best idea because the Tyrolians they have they are very proud people. We have a similar dialect, so it's, they speak a similar German dialect, but it's different. And they're very proud people. They have um, had laws going back into the medieval times um, regarding their military service for the Austrian Empire, for example. So they were uh, they don't uh, um, serve in the military outside of Tyrol. And um, then, and they were very strong Catholics. And the Bavarians, in this time, um, were as an as an enlightened kingdom. They tried to strengthen the state authority, and therefore they um, there, there were friction between the Tyrolians and the Bavarians. And in eighteen oh nine. Um, there was the uprising the uh, um, uh, against the, the Bavarian rules uh, in Tyrol. And um, then the invasion of Austrian regular troops um, uh, into Bavaria um, uh, and the, the, the battles taking place in Bavaria and then switching back to, to Vienna. And then uh, we have the two big battles, uh, Wagram and Aspen Estling uh, near Vienna. And Tyrol is, is a side theater. And um, there, there are the battles raging in these mountains. It's more a, a guerrilla warfare. So, so you have these insurgents fighting small Bavarian columns retreating to Bavaria, and um, then in the in the um, uh, in the late days of April 1809, then uh, Tyrol is freed of the Bavarian troops, and um, the Tyrolians do incursions into this upper Bavarian territory um, where I live, and um, these raids are going on until July, and in in July 1809, um, when when there was already an armistice, 
um, the, the combatants, the Tyrolines and the Austrians, uh, the regular Austrians uh, attached to um, the uh, Tyrolean rebels, they um, they made even uh, they, they made further uh, progress in Bavaria and, and, uh, and did these raids. And one of these raids was taking place a couple of days after the armistice, but no, none of the combatants did knew that. And um, um, then we have uh, in the center of the screen now is Murnau, and um, uh, you see over Sörchering, uh, little up to, and then uh, there was a battle which is called the Battle of Spatzenhausen. And it's very interesting because a, a large Tyrolean force entered Murnau um, am Staffelsee and they um, uh, wanted to, to get shoes, oxen, clothes, uh, amount of money, and, uh, and then to move on. So, so they try to uh, get money back from the Bavarians. Their uh, point of view, the Bavarians uh, see through uh, taxes and so on. So, so it was some kind of paying back now and um, then they marched on and uh, the Bavarians fought a fighting retreat. There were um, a, a small column of Bavarians uh, doing a, a fighting retreat and, and they were uh, purchased by the by the Austrians uh, as, um, about a hundred um, cavalrymen uh, of Austrian regulars and then about 2,000 Austrian uh, Tyrolines um, um, uh, Schützen as they called them, riflemen but uh, they 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 had uh, uh, um, rifles, but there were some less armed uh, troops involved as well. And they were uh, 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 a Bavarian uh, uh, mixed attack formation of light infantry reserve uh, companies. Um, they were stationed at Benedict Boyan, which is on in the east uh, um, uh, on the map. Uh, yeah, exactly, Robs. Thank you. It, it, it's an old um, a monastery, uh, a Benedictine monastery, and um, it was. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure the English word secularized. It's um, so 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 it, it it was made from from the church property. It it, it was uh, being um, taken by the state to become a, a state. state yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and um, in this progress, uh, it was an army um, um, reserve depot uh, where the Bavarian army had uh, had a command post, um, uh, where Oberst Graf von Arco, the commander of this uh, whole region, um, had his main command post guarding the whole line. Um, um, stretching over 100 kilometers uh, along these mountains um, to guard the border to Tyrol. And from there, the, the, this relief column was marching to the west, to, the, to Spatzenhausen, joining uh, the retreating Bavarian forces. And then there was a small engagement on the Bavarian side, about 500 combatants. Um, and about 200 combatants on the um, Austrian Tyrolean side. And um, it was a pleasure for me because I, I've read the original accounts, but I haven't walked the battlefield um, until Rob joined me. And with his army experience and, and interest in Napoleonic times, we, we discovered, walked the battlefield and, and, and tried to locate the action taking place. And the interesting part is you have these two battle lines engaging each other. Um, there's an exchange of cannon fire. The, Aust uh, the Austrians have these uh, three-pounder small infantry guns, um, which are very outdated by this time in 1809. And the Bavarians have um, um, three uh, uh, six-pounders. And there's this ex exchange of artillery fire. Um, uh, the Bavarians are outnumbered almost four to one. But um, okay. then the uh, Dominic. Dominic, uh, yeah. we're, we're, to let our audience know, we're in this area here, the um, near Spatzenhausen, the Tyroleans are, are around this general area, and the Bavarians defending Bavaria are in this general area. So just orienting people to the, our maps. Am I correct there? That's the road that we were on? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, back to you. So, back to you. We, yes. Yeah, and 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 we believe Rob and me believe believe that the battle from from reading the account was taking place between 
in, in around this area. And the interesting part is you have this exchange of cannon fire, you have an exchange of musketry, um, um, but the main action is fought actually by cavalry um, uh, uh, squadrons, as you have both sides have around 100 cavalrymen. And um, the, the Austrians try to uh, fire at the, at the Bavarian gunners to prevent them of using the superior artillery because they have six pounders against the three pounders and they have more pieces. Um, then the, uh, the Austrians try to use their regular cavalry, which is probably the best unit in, in, in this mixed formation they have to, to, to battle the, um, the Bavarian gunners. And in this um, moment of the battle, the Bavarian cavalry commander decided to cross the battlefield diagon um, in, 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 in front of uh, uh, his own uh, Bavarian line infantry. And, and, and then he attacks the Austrian cavalry in the flank and is overthrowing it. And I think from, from reading the account, it's this small, short, brutal cavalry fight then overthrows the Austrian cavalry um, which is retreating, and um, this causes some panic in the in the huge uh, uh, Austrian and uh, Tyrolean army, um, uh, which uh, causes a rout. And these Tyroleans are then um, fleeing towards the border, so to say. They are fleeing south to get back to 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 Garmisch and 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 get back to the mountains and uh, the Bavarians are, are, are saying um, if we had a larger amount of cavalry on that day we could have taken a lot of prisoners because it was a complete rout by, by the Austrians and so it, it, it was very interesting to see that actually uh, 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 a force which is four times larger than this small Bavarian force um, um, is routing because as a lack of discipline, as they aren't used, that their own regulars are fleeing in this case. I think if, if on the Austrian side there were more regular Austrian line infantry troops, for example, it would be a completely different battle because they would actually have understood that their, their cavalry is only retreating, not, not fleeing. So they... Rob, have, have you something to, to, to add? You, you were on the ground with me? Yes, yes. Um, well, um, that was a fantastic insight into it that. Was That's, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm, I will add, but I'm going to hand over to Dom Fielder. Dom, what are your thoughts and questions on on that? Well, and of course, here am I making everybody seasick with my manipulation of the screen. I'm not sure what that's looking like at your angle, but it's it's looking fine. Honestly, hmm? it's looking fine. I was listening to you talk to Dom. It was such a passion about what been going on um and i was thinking i was was looking at the time to think in uh is it the is it the um digby smith book or haythorn weight which is the book of um napoleonic battles which it's about you know the size of a, a telephone directory in old money and the the battle you're describing wouldn't even make a footnote on it but here it is in and you brought it to life and i'm looking at this terrain do you from the diary account that you had, other than obviously buildings changing, are we looking at a very similar terrain, do you think? So very little cover. Um, yes. Yeah. At all. It's a, So if yeah. you, I mean, if the cavalry goes, and I hear what you're saying about that, the experience of infantry, but if the cavalry goes, the infantry have got to be feeling very isolated at this point, haven't they? I think. There was... Yeah. We, we we stopped on, on around this road um, yeah. and we could identify Spitzenhausen to the rear. We could identify yeah. this large farm and this 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 hill here, which was a, a natural point to um, um, set up a defensive line in front of Spitzenhausen and also defend this road here as it goes to Munich. And in this tree yeah. line, which still exists today, we identified yes. that there were infantry lines going this way, and but the the number of people was very small. So the entire battlefield 
if if the if the single Tyrolean gun sat on the road here, it wouldn't have been very long. The we felt that the Bavarians had come in here, and that the, and that there was this natural creek line following my cursor this way, that we felt here was the way to get under the guns for the, the Bavarian cavalry, and and put pressure here, which of course encouraged. Austrian and Tyroleans to move back to Schwarzenhausen and, and move away. Um, right. Oh, I see. Okay. And and as we've heard, when the guns are firing, the infantry stand firm. Don't worry what the cavalry are doing because they'll come and go as they please. And yes, the Tyrolean cavalry moved or shifted, and of course that unnerved the Tyrolean irregulars. they not, you know, they thought that the, the front was collapsing. Um, yeah. So, and also, the other thing I was going to say, sorry, I'm going to say, at the foot of these mountains, and we would have seen in the maps, large water bodies here, and this is a very flat, fertile area. So it's reasonable to assume that this has been a agricultural area for, for a much longer time. We can see dark patches of woods, but this is this would have been an absolute grain bowl even 200 years ago. So it wouldn't have been, um, this has not been recently cleared. But this would have been normal, you know, as we would see Central France um, um, sort of... Uh, Rob, and I, uh, Rob and I were using um, uh, an online version um, uh, of maps created in 1820, 1830. They are online and, and, and accessible for free. And uh, yeah. um, um, if you look at the terrain, then you see it hasn't changed that much. Perhaps there are some larger bodies of wood or the, 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 the bodies of wood, the, the, the forest would be a bit, bit, bit larger. But and apart from that, and, and, and of course the villages grew in size immensely, but apart from that, it's a rural rural area, and it was a lot of open fields um, at, at at the foothills uh, of the Alps. Uh, you see the effect there. Yes, no, that's fantastic. Yeah. The um. No. Again, we, we Rob and I would uh, chatted at previous times about the importance of walking the ground. Uh, and it's it's important to us as writers that, like I said, if you just you can find inspiration if you're sort of playing a skirmish game or you come across a a, a diary for for writing or for, you know, for 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 playing, but actually walking it, walking that ground, gives you the sense of, of exactly what's going on and how you're either going to build, say, a, a skirmish scale game out of it, or how you're going to build in some detail for writing it. Did you find that sense of when you, when you were there, thinking, right? I can now visualize where these things are. Is it easier to visualize than Dominic when you were there, looking at that? So you got, like I said, you got Rob's military eye as well. Yeah, it it, it actually was it was interesting in two points for 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 me. It was normally. I'm used to read Napoleonic novels, seeing a movie, a, a television series, and then you have all these small impacts. For example, a ridge line, uh, um, a, a tree line. You have a small water uh, way going across, and then in a novel you read how important it is that it it, it made it uh, made an impact on the battle because soldiers taking cover there and 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 and, and, and there's something like that. Um, in this case, it was a battle I, I've known from historical research, but as I haven't walked the ground before, I was unaware of all these obstacles and walking the ground, seeing as it actually is. And I did it with Rob and his military view on, on the battlefield, which was an additional um, insight. So, so we had this common interest in Napoleonic tactics, how could this battle be evolving from the account we had um, when we were standing on the ground? We had the historical maps, and then it was this additional view of a, of a, of a military experiencing, okay, 
what, what's the decision making of the commanding officer? What were these decisions the Bavarian um, 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 commander had to take? And then we were discussing this as well, standing on the ground. And this was from, for me, the first time I did it, it was quite an, an, a good experience. I really enjoyed it. I was gonna say, just, just by looking at the map that Rob's got on the screen now, None of that would come to life, would it? If you if you if you were being asked to, you think you know, of, of somebody who set out that day. Maybe they don't know the ground particularly well. They're being asked to maybe clear out the troops who might be holding that crossroads, holding that ridge line. None of the features on that ground would come to life from a simple sketch map until you've arrived there, and until you've seen the problems, and until you know the 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 calibre of the soldiers that you're actually trying to command or the calibre of the opposition that you're up against. So I think, yeah. to me, yeah. those are also the things that build into a, a commander's decisions in the moment and they influence that part of the battle. And it can be a very small bit, but when when things start to go wrong in battles, that, that can escalate very quickly. Because if, if soldiers see somebody retreating, retreating rather hurriedly, which then turns into them throwing their equipment away, it must be human nature to think, well, what do they know that I don't know? Yes. <laughs> you know, and if it's good enough for them, you know, the starting to move backwards, it might actually be good enough for me as well. May I add to that? Um, Dominic, uh, Dominic, had brought these magnificent uh, historical maps that are available, overlays that are available within Bavaria. So it makes it very, very... Um, the Dominic's original diaries on his phone, the maps, and here we are on the ground. And I was going to make a comment about that soldierly aspect. I'm just going to zoom out further and further. And I'm going to zoom out further and further. And here I've come to a point of the monastery. So the, yeah. the the commanding officer of this green line has now marched his soldiers across this distance. And this distance is 2,000 metres. There is the scale. So this must be about 20 kilometres, about a, maybe four or you know, five-hour response. He would be aware that there are Tyrolean Austrians to his south. There may well be a column in this space. He knows that the best is to get around this, this high ground. And so the for the soldiers to have marched all this way, and then on this little road coming into Spatzenhausen, we can see the major German roads of the day, and we can see the old roads, you know, from the bet from the monastery coming to uh, to the village. And here on this little crossroads, on this little hill, um, which is now a quarry, you can see the indent of the quarry. Um, mm. um, yes, yeah, so not only is the, the pulling back, but for the Bavarian soldiers who have been marching all day, um, uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating to, uh, you know, racing to, to between Spotzenhausen, what's our town just to, was it under Schirling? Uh, forgive my pronunciation there, Dominic. This this back road to Munich. Yeah, it it's it it's in the, in in the account it was very uh, uh, that the account made clear that the the Bavarian officer doing the retreat from uh, Murnau to Schwarzenhausen, he decided to move to the east to Harbach, um, which led as a consequence of his decision led the road to the north open for the Tyrolines and the road to the north is the road to Munich. So he was in, 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 in a tight spot. He had to decide making a stand with little forces and he, he won't make, wouldn't achieve much. He can retreat to march east to Harbach, um, which is where uh, Rob's cursor is now. Yeah, exactly. Um, Harbach here. And uh, because there the retreating column will arrive. Um, or he can make a stand to, to block the road to the north, um, trying to delay the Austrian advance, 
because they could probably reach Munich. From this point, it's about a 60 kilometer march to Munich. A force of about 2000 would be not enough to take this long march. But if, if you think this Bavarian, this young Bavarian officer, he had to take a decision which is weighing a lot and, and he decided to make way. So, so he decided to go, where is uh, my relief column uh, uh, approaching? And then we can, he can talk to his superior, Oberskraft Arco, and they can decide and they can try to take action again. And which is what they did. They, they replenished at Harbach the ammunition because in his account, he said the skirmishing um, um, almost emptied all his ammunition supply and they had about 60 rounds per, per man. So they were doing a lot of shooting during this fighting retreat. And then they replenished their uh, supplies in Harbach and advanced again, and then there was the Battle of Spatzenhausen. Right, okay. So again, for, if you think for, as I said, it's a young officer, I think one thing we might not give um, commanders enough credit for is that is, is the unknown. I mean, we, we look at things often in, in a way of historical certainty, that we're reading things, think, well, this happened after the event, but that's not what these people know at the time. They, they don't know what's around them. They they have a, an idea of where their the relief column is, but they're not certain always about where, or they're, they're rarely certain about where the enemy is. And as you say, if you make a stand at this point, um, how do you know you're making the right decision? Because it's already a small force, and it already might have supply problems. Are you just throwing away the lives of your men for a really empty gesture? And it is that you know discretion being the better part of valor in this case, isn't it? But and falling back to get more information, get more supplies, and then deciding right at this point we need to seal the road. The sealing beforehand yeah, is yeah. actually something that we just don't have the. We don't have the manpower for. No, I think that, that's yeah. that's a really. I mean, that's a great little sort of vignette just there, isn't it? Of a, of, of an encounter, which in any other time, would be completely overlooked. But it's it's a and, vital part for that little. And and for us collectors and gamers and writers, and you know, it would be wonderful if if our good friend Mr. Keith Rocco was to paint it or something, but. Um, We've got a, a young battalion commander, probably the rank of major. Um, he's got a small group. I, I don't have to worry about the, his, the actual historical details, but I think I'm fairly right there. Dominic, am I not? There was an infantry. He had a, a small group of cavalry. He had a gun, and he's re, he's withdrawing back, uh, being resupplied, and also finding his superior commander, a, a colonel, who adds more infantry and another gun. And, and these tiny... Everything can pivot on two Bavarian six pounders versus a Austrian three pounder, um, and suddenly the that colonel arrives in Habach, finds out the details, makes a decision. You now he's he's that colonel is now saying, "I'm going to put it all this way of my force, as opposed to bring you back into this space, which is the other." Op opportunity for it to occur so as you said dominic all of those uh decisions um the, the impact of, of that time nobody knew that this was going to be the battle of spatzenhausen it was just what are we doing in the next few hours where is the next best thing to do we're all exhausted we're all tired um and off they march down this little road um yes and and, and they end up here uh, very very exciting. Yeah. Any any closing or closing comments? We're, we're we're conscious of time, but any closing comments there from Dominic Pott? Thank you for this fantastic sharing. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm pleased that you're interested. Um, I I think it's it's this this is my this is my home ground. So for me, it's yes, a pleasure that ground? I have. It, Bring up his home with. To... There is, there's yeah, Dominic's but... house. There's his house. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, so, so it, it, it was very interesting that I discovered this battlefield and um, um, uh, this action is taking place after the armistice. So it's, it's, it, it's again this uncertainty because the Napoleon and, 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 and Napoleon, his generals, his marshals, they had already made peace with the Austrian Empire. But this battle is taking place because the, the troops on the ground, the, the local commanders, they didn't know that there was already an armistice because it's 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 the 19th century. There aren't telephones and anything. And this is what what what's so intriguing. I, I find it quite fascinating to see you, you have a small engagement. Um, it's a side seat. Uh, it's uh, as you mentioned, Dominic. It, it wouldn't even be a footnote. Then the, the the most thing about I, I read about this battle was footnotes. So if you read about the Tyrolean incursion, you have footnotes, and then you see okay, there is a war ministry diary about the this defense of this mountain line, and then I found information on the battle. But it's quite scarce, and it's still I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, if I'm I'm still searching for more material. If there's if, if there's more evidence of the battle, more 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 articles, more more um, high account witnesses. Um, to learn more about it, yeah. Let's see. That, that, that's I, a... I was thinking there when you're saying that about the side show. It's a bit like uh, the Dryden character in Lawrence of Arabia, who describes the whole theater as, as a you know a, a side show of a side show. And what you're saying there about peace, it's fine for the French to have made this peace with the Austrians, but for the Tyroleans who clearly want something of their own out of this, you know, if, if they get a chance to suddenly put pressure on Munich, they'll be taking that for as long as that option is on the table, I suppose they'll they'll want to say, well, actually, it's not about that deal. We're not really interested about France and Austria. It's about our, you know, us having our own independence, isn't it? So if we can you know, if we can put 2,000 men on the road to Munich, 2,000 men might sound like 5,000 men or 10,000 men when the story's told, yes. told somewhere else. And suddenly we're able to yeah. say, well, these are our local terms. The, you know, this is what we want in our peace deal. So, it, yeah, it's, it's, got a, yeah. it's got a tempo all of its own, isn't it? Very yeah, important. Yeah, exactly. and my, you know, the, the last thought for me on this is um, looking at, as I do in, in Flanders, there's uh, the situations where there are actions of the, the the foot guards, British foot guards, seem to have been fighting three separate battles in one day, and just when they think they're resting at the end of the day, having marched, fought, and marched over fifteen miles, they get told, "Actually, no, you need to just just snip off, capture another town," on be, and it's just here on the map, and it must have been, you know, at the almost like that sort of back of a fag packet sketch because the maps were so scarce in Flanders. And yet when you look at that situation there, the things you've just shown us there on the ground, what commanders are coming up against is is nothing like the information that they're getting. They're having to make those decisions. They're making them when they're tired. They're making them with a whole series of criteria that quite often we don't have enough understanding of. We, we don't give them the I often I don't feel that I'd give them the credit that they deserve you know, to make these instant decisions which influence much bigger theatres quite often. Mm -hmm. Very gentlemen, very good. Very good. Our our how our half hour of uh recording that one I'm, I'm, but we are going to hang around and, and, and we're going to continue to check. But we're going to wrap the, uh, the the recording up. So thank you very much, Dominic Polt, for joining us. Uh, and and coming up uh, next next time, we're going to chat with uh, Dr. Martin Boycott Brown from uh, from Canterbury, England, uh, who is a historian on Napoleon's first campaign. I'm looking forward to that. Now, everyone, you can uh, contact us on our emails, Facebook Messenger, or Twitter, and uh, and you can join us here at Rally Point by contacting me at for a Zoom invite. But we do want to hear from you, any games, any books, any events, any treasured items that you have. And we'd love you to share Rally Point with your friends so we can hear from them as well. Any previous Rally Point chats are up on the YouTube channel. So it's, uh, it's good night from Dominic Fielder and it's good morning from me.